That's the sound of a lore bomb because a new Splatoon interview just dropped. Splatoon recently released a DLC called Side Order. If you don't know anything about Side Order or Splatoon, I made a full video talking about everything you need to know, so check that out. But we just got an interview talking about Side Order with Side Order's director art director, and the sound director. The article discusses story and design concepts, so spoiler warning ahead. Number 1. Side Order began development when the base game for Splatoon 3 was released. Initially, their only plan was to create a DLC content with the concept of Order, which was the Final Fest's losing theme. Number 2. The idea of climbing the Tower of Order was set in stone from the beginning of development. Repeat Immediately challenging stages to climb a tower fit well with the theme of order, so this was a decision that they agreed on very quickly. Additionally, Octo Expansion, the previous game's DLC, had the player going deeper into the ocean, so to contrast with that, climbing upwards fit nicely. Number 3. The setting, though virtual, was created with the sense of direction of order that felt organic and somewhat warm. Because the setting is a fictional world within the fictional world of Splatoon, if the game felt too virtual, it might feel too similar to what we already have as a game and create a sense of deja vu. So in order to avoid that, they incorporated an expression of organicness. They achieved this by using the concept of memory and nostalgia of the character Number 4. The miscellaneous items that you find throughout the stage and also in the shops is actually a representation of the memories that Marina and the other Octoling developers hold. Throughout the game, you'll find a mix of items that seem to be completely random. You'd find a military machine that the troopers used next to a stack of pancakes. Though random at first, this is actually a representation of the Octoling's memories, representing their childhood and also their military years, and some, their sanitized time. Number 5. The snow-like substance that is falling on the City of Order is actually incinerated ash from the tower. What ash, you may be asking? It is the ash of those memories. The Tower of Order serves as a factory where the memory cubes are generated grayscaled, and eventually incinerated. Though the ash looks beautiful, it is quite scary. Number 6. Members decide what weapon your palette would have. For characters like Callie and Marie, who already canonically have a main weapon, it's pretty clear why they have a charger and a roller. But for characters that don't have a canonic main weapon, such as DJ Octavio, members decide what weapon would be best fit for them. Number 7. Pearl likes being a drone. After being returned to her humanoid state by Marina, she now freely can choose when she wants to be a drone. Apparently, Pearl likes high places and loves to be able to freely fly around, which is why she chooses to be a drone. Number 8. The creatures that you see in Memverse are actually representations of program nodes. Unlike Inklings and Octolings of the surface who care about fashion and wear clothes, these creatures are not wearing clothes but are made to wear clothes. Therefore, they were designed in a sense where their cloth is wrapped around their body. Number 9. Cypher, the shopkeeper, is the only program node that is aware of its existence in a virtual world. Cypher is the only NPC that you can talk to that exists only in the virtual world. Cypher gained consciousness because of a lot of other characters' various consciousness in members happening to flow into Cypher. Because it has gained the mixture of thoughts from various consciousness, Cypher can come off as a little disjointed and has a little bit of an accent. Though seemingly well informed, because Cypher is also a baby born within the members, Cypher is interested in everything. Number 10. The training school that Marina and Act both went to was specialized in training elite Octarians. Within the Octarian society, there are different types of troopers. For example, those that can change into Octolings and those that cannot. The school that each individual goes to is not by their choice. It is chosen by their abilities and aptitude. From here, we're going to be delving into the design aspects. Number 11. Marina and Pearl's outfits are space-themed because they're world-class artists now. 
Pearl had her space-themed jacket designed for 200 million of the in-game currency to represent that she was going to go above and beyond the world standards. Marina was designed with a bright colored suit because they simply thought that it would look good on her. Additionally, they believed that the suit gave her an engineer-like impression. Her tentacles have a starry pattern to it because of Pearl's influence. Number 12. The color palettes were designed in reference to the midi pads. A midi pad is a device frequently used in live concerts and song making. The color chips initially did not have the gimmick of it making noises when you pressed on it. When you touch the color chips in the game, it'll start playing some notes. This gimmick was initially not planned in development, but one of the programmers decided to implement it one day, and though it surprised the directors, they decided to keep it in. Additionally, if you tap the color chips during the final boss fight, you might be able to hear something special. Number 13. The gelatins were initially planned to be more realistic. The idea to use bones as a design motif came up pretty naturally when they decided to make a white world. Since the concept of the game mechanics was to defeat a large number of enemies in which each enemy type would move according to simple commands, a school of bonefish was suitable for the design since it is difficult to sense their intentions. Initially, they were designed with realistic skeletal structures. But due to a design change, they kept the subtle creepiness but also added an endearingness to them. I for one think they're quite adorable, though also a little creepy at the same time, so I think this design worked out great. By the way, in the design notes, it's noted that they're compromised of detachable parts reminiscent of plastic models. This part wasn't in the interview, but I also noticed that during the parallel cannon fight, a lot of the background elements reminded me a lot of plastic models too. Number 14. The enemies are named after musical terms. Because Marina is also a creator of music along with the creator of Memverse, it made sense to name the enemies after musical terms. However, before they were officially named during development, they used names like Bouncing Enemy and Bomb Pew Pew Enemy. They sound a lot cooler with their new official names, but I personally really like these code names. Number 15. The pinging Marseille is based on a sea urchin. The bumpers throughout the stage that is used to fight the boss is actually made of soy sauce. The black liquid that comes out? Soy sauce. That being said, number 16, the pinging Marseille is actually a pudding. <laughs> I know, I know, probably confusing, I was confused at first, but there is apparently this fun fact where if you put soy sauce on pudding, it'll taste like sea urchin. So when you bump the pudding against the soy sauce, it becomes a sea urchin. By the way, when you break the shell on its first form and it enters its second form, its protrusions are rice bins with sushi rice inside. Number 17. The asynchronous Rondo is actually a hospitality robot created by Marina. However, after being taken over by order, it became disastrous and aggressive. As for its design, it was inspired by a revolving sushi and the merry-go-round. Number 18. The asynchronous Rondo's boss fight stage is based on the Panopticon prison. A Panopticon prison is a building shaped in a circle where inmates cannot tell when they are being observed so they feel as though they are always being observed. From the center of the room, a guard can observe any of the inmates. I think this works for this boss fight because it also feels like you're always being watched by the enemy. I also think the flashing light is reminiscent of a prison. By the way, the music playing in the asynchronous rondo is kind of creepy, but because this world of order takes inspiration from everybody's memories and consciousness, perhaps this song is also a memorable song to somebody out there. Number 19. The Parallel Canon is a data copy of Agent 4. More specifically, the one with the hair is a direct copy of Agent 4. Meanwhile, the ones without the hair and wearing full helmets are a copy of the copy of Agent 4. By the way, it's been confirmed that if you have the save data for Splatoon 2, it'll mimic your Agent 4 from that game. Number 20. 
The funky shapes that you see outside and also within the lobby are elements of the program that are represented as planktons. These planktons react to sound and emit light. This idea and the design for the lobby was suggested by staff members who used to create installation art when they were students. Which leads me to one of my favorite facts. Number 22. Side Order's development did include core staff members that worked on the main series, but also there were many young staff members that used to be students during Splatoon 1 and 2 that became central to the development of Side Order. These new young members of the team were incredibly enthusiastic and their enthusiasm allowed them to make the colorless world of order filled with color. Number 23. The early floors of the Tower of Order represent Marina and her colleagues' memories of their childhood. Number 24. The main soundtrack for this game represents those memories lost. The soundtrack tries to invoke the warm yet sad feeling of losing these childhood memories. This is why the soundtrack includes mysterious voices that sound somewhat nostalgic, but you're not sure who exactly is speaking. Number 25. As you climb the Tower of Order, the soundtrack will begin to have a certain snarl to it, as if these octolings and their memories were cut into pieces and roughly arranged to be excessively orderly. Number 26. The soundtrack throughout the stages are actually played by the fish. These fish swimming around in the stages will play songs from memories. These schools of fish have a name called mnemonic clouds. Number 27. The rescued Marina actually has no idea about the song that she sang when she was possessed. The director imagines that Pearl will let her know later on, and Marina would be very embarrassed about it. Number 28. In contrast to Marina's solo song, the song that plays when you fight the Overlorder the second time tries to emphasize Pearl's cuteness in order to make the fight feel a little more lighthearted. Number 29. In the DLC's post-game, you can visit Incopla Square and see Pearl and Marina. Pearl's got a lot more comfortable with being recorded, so though in the previous game she would occasionally eat a snack or two, now she eats hamburgers and french fries. Number 30. Splatoon 2 DLC fans will notice Isopadre has made it to the surface. According to the director, apparently he was drawn to the plushy UFO catcher that was recently added to the square. Though he now lives on the surface, he still lives modestly, so he probably stays in the cafe from opening to closing hours. Number 31. Most of the residents weren't that affected despite going through grayscaling. Many of the residents were already pretty laid back, so having a few lose their motivation wasn't that big of an impact. And finally, number 32. Act reaches the surface. After regaining consciousness in the deep sea metro, she makes her way to the surface on her own. After reaching the surface, she receives help from Off the Hook and Agent 8 and begins her DJ and song making career on the surface. Her previously made songs under the name Deadfish was actually unpaid, so after collecting her unpaid royalties, she was able to secure her living expenses. She likes staying indoors so she doesn't go out often, but Somehow she got submitted into Table Turf Battle, so she'll come out to play if you challenge her. I'm glad that Act has recovered and is enjoying her life on the surface. This was the information that I was able to pick up from the article. Let me know which fact was your favorite. And don't forget to subscribe because I'm still kind of new and you probably won't be able to find me again if you don't subscribe. So subscribe to remember that I exist and I hope to see you again. Also, leave a like to let me know if I did a good job on trends translating this because this took a lot of effort, <laughs> but it was also incredibly fun. So let me know if you would like to see more. This was Nyag. Thanks for watching.